Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. All right. I keep saying this every show. This is the new norm, and I have got to get used to not having an opening. I'm used to the opening song and the fireworks and all this stuff to give me time uh, to share this out. But I want to make sure uh, that we are live so I can share this out to our group page. Our group page. Yes, we do have a M to the Rock Facebook Live group channel. Ah, there y'all are. There you are. So let me go to our page and I need everyone, um, all the M2 God gangsters. That's right. The God gang. We got one tonight. I'm telling you, we got one tonight. I mean, we got the real nizzle for zizzle in the house. This guy, I tell you what, I can do time with this guy. This guy can crank up the tank. I tell you what, he can crank. He'll get us racked up. He will get us in that rack, bro. Uh, Y'all got a, we got a good show tonight. Yes. Boston Durkin backstage right now, signing autographs. Okay, he's on the red carpet. He's getting his face powdered up and getting all ready for the big show. But uh, he's got something, and it's going to be here live on M2 The Rock. So here's what we do. We gather round, gather round, gather round, clowns. Michael Moulton, M2 The Rock, coming to you live from Dallas, Texas, baby. D-Town. Mm, 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 the 214. That's right, the 214. The 214 is the area code for Dallas. So like when you're in the 214, baby, I'm from Dallas. I'm from D-Town, baby, the Dirty D. I ain't got nothing. I ain't got nothing, man. I ain't got nothing. All right, so here, oh, there we are. All right, so let me get this shared out real quick because we got to get this out to, uh, we have a group that's called M2 The Rock Facebook Live Group. That way everybody can see this. Is that my man, Peter? My man, Peter, is in the comments. My man, James Guthrie. Good to see you, James. James, I will never forget the time when I saw you on Facebook Live in Tool, Texas. That's right. Tool, Texas. James Guthrie slamming his sandals against one another. Everybody shooting at him. Everybody was shooting at James Guthrie. But him too picked up that phone. I said, hey, man, I like you. I like what you got. I like what you got. Why don't you come over to M2 The Rock Studios at iHeartRadio. Let's get your picture taken and let's put a show on. And we did it. My man, James Guthrie. We got a new Peter in the house. We got a bunch of Peters in the house. My man, Boston Durkin, coming up here in just a second. So we're backstage and I got this shared out. Let me do it one more time. One more time. And there we go. And I can put this away. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Moulton. I'm your host tonight. And we talk about on this show, what do we talk about? What do we talk about on this show? We talk about drug addiction. Yes, we do talk about drug addiction. We talk about alcoholism. Yes, we do. For the newcomers that are just joining us, and like, what do we talk about? We talk about those two things because I can relate to drug addiction, alcoholism. I am, I was, I am an addict. I am an addict in long-term recovery, okay? Now, I also talk about hurts, habits, and hangups. All right. We talk about everything. We're very diversified on this show because the more sober I get, the more sober I get, the more I start realizing that I'm addicted to visible things to try to fix my invisible problems. So what do we do? We talk about solutions on this show, spiritual solutions for my human problems. That's what we talk about on M2 The Rocks. So I don't want anybody to be confused about that, right? We have guests from all over the world on this show, and it's going to be a great show tonight, as all shows are, all right? So without further, before we get into that, this show is brought to you by DFW Coin and Jewelry. That's right, DFW Coin and Jewelry, Kristen Oyster, my man KO in Dallas, Texas. Kristen Oyster with DFW Coin and Jewelry. He has been with the M2 The Rock since day one. That's right, day one. And then we have the great Healing Springs Ranch. Healing Springs Ranch Residential Treatment Center, one hour north of the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And check this out. We may go a little long today. Hang on, Boston. Hang on, okay? He's like, I, I got him. In the, I'm holding him back, all right? Hang on, Boston. Tomorrow, tomorrow, Rachel Stacy. by the way, Rachel Stacy is upstairs in her studio right now on a video call in Hollywood with The Voice. Yeah, right now, right now. You may hear her. She's up there. She is interviewing for The Voice. Don't tell anybody. 
Okay. Anyway, so that's what she's doing right now. And then we will be tomorrow filming her new video, Godspeed at Healing Springs Ranch. That's right. Healing Springs Ranch, one hour north of the Dallas Fort Worth area where I am a recovery coach and I work on the clinical team staff there and I perform groups on Thursdays to help prepare people to help prepare people for long term recovery. So, all right, without further ado, we got before we get into it. Hold on, everybody. Hold on. Hold on. Monday. Monday. This just in. Keenan Williams. Yeah, my man. Keenan Williams back on him to the rock. This guy's incredible. He did time in the penitentiary. He's on fire for God out there spreading the message. And he actually works on the Trump campaign. Yeah, that's as most that's as much politics as we'll get on this show. But yes, uh, Keenan Williams will be on next week. And then Hillary Roberts, hip hop artist. Uh, is out from Beverly Hills. We'll be on the show on the 29th. And we've got lots of guests that we're working on right now. Okay, at this time, we're going to bring on our guest, the great Boston Durkin. Before I bring him on, I saw this guy. I don't watch much Facebook Live. I really don't. I'll scroll through, scroll through, do the likes and make sure everything's good. And um, and I, we put it down. Rachel and I spend time together. But here's what's, here's what's up. I'm scrolling here and I see this cat. I see this cat just, just putting it on, okay? And he's got this gift. He's got this gift. This he, he kept me engaged and I'm listening to him. Okay. I'm like, homeboy's shooting. He's shooting. You know what I mean? I'm like, what's going on here? And he's out there getting it. And I said, you know what? I really want to get to know this guy. I want to hear more of this guy. And I looked past all the shooting and I looked at what his message was and his passion and love. I said, I want to hear this guy's story. Before I start taking inventory, before I start taking his inventory, I need to look at my own inventory, right? And the reason why he has got my attention is because he's like me, huh? Right? Maybe I'm looking at something myself. So I reached out to this guy and I said, listen, I want to talk to you. And we talked on the phone and I said, I really want to hear your story. I want to know who you are, what it was like, what happened and what it's like today, because this is all about staying sober. Love and tolerance is our code. And at this time, I want to bring on the great Boston Durkin from Corpus Christi, Texas. Hello, Boston. Boston. Yeah. <laughs> How you doing, brother? Good to see you, my friend. And, God and Squad welcome. all day, every day. You know what time it is. <laughs> so where'd you get that? God Squad all day, every day. What's that mean? That's just, uh, it's something that came to me a while back, uh, actually when I was in my crazy period, uh, you know, in the movie magic chapter of fire and ice, the book I wrote, and, uh, it was just something that came to me. And then I went after my release, I was incarcerated for a while. It just became the group of people that were on my Facebook page and it just became a thing. And, it, and, and uh, you know, we really just ran with it. So we, we make t-shirts and stuff. It's all good. You know? So let's take our time tonight. Let's let's really take our time tonight and let's walk through this because um, I want to get to know you. I, yeah. I want to give I want to give everybody a fair shot. And behind the scenes, we've had some really good phone conversations together. And and there is a Boston in there that I've grown to like. I really have. And it, it, I've had a good time this week uh, getting to know you. Let's talk about your story, what it was like, who is Boston Durkin as a kid? And when did you realize, whoa, I've got a problem with drugs and alcohol? Oh, right away. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, look, I grew up uh, in a little town called Reading, Massachusetts. It's a suburb like 10 minutes north of Boston, Mass. And, uh, you know, it was like an all white, lily white town. Uh, you know, a lot of people had some money there. It was, it was just your normal, you know, we used to go play wiffle ball. You know, things normal kids do, you know, and then, uh, you know, I started smoking weed at like 12 years old. Wow. And, you know, it was like but the, the opening chapter of my book's like stand by me on weed, man. It's it's like a, a great group of guys, really great friends. I mean, lifelong friends. And uh, we, we just we were having a blast. We were young, you know, and uh, when I took my first drink is when it really happened. The first drink I had ever took. I knew walk, there was walk there. us through that. Walk us through that. Well, we, we were, uh, you know, we were partying, you know, smoking weed or whatever. And the first time that I experimented with alcohol, we were drinking like some cheap $10 vodka or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I remember me, it was me and my buddy and uh, we mixed it with some orange juice or whatever. And just like normal kids do. But I remember the first sip, M2. The first sip I'll never forget for the rest of my life. 
that's when I knew there was something different about me than than, than other people. I knew right then and there. Right, I, mean, I can, I can I, relate. There was a chemical change within me. I could I recognized it right away, and it was like a, my whole group of friends. A lot of us came from childhood trauma. You know, we had it. We just, you know, it was that group of kids I hung out with. Mm-hmm. You know, and it was like the alcohol immediately took away all the childhood trauma. Everything I didn't like about myself went away immediately. Yeah. Everything I liked about myself was amplified. So I knew right away there was a problem. And, and, and I ended up I, not long after that, I was an everyday vodka drinker by 14 years old. Mm. And I was going to school drunk, you know, and it was like, I, you know, there's a, I'm a hundred percent Irish and there's a lot of Irish people up there and drinking is kind of accepted. It was it more so back then than it was now. This is a million years ago. But, right. You know, but yeah, I was I was drinking every single day and uh, the problem started right away, man. And what do you mean by that? The problem started away, right away. When we started drinking, we realized that you did you rec- did you recognize at an early age this is not normal. Were there were there people around you that didn't do the things that you did and would you ask yourself that question, why am I doing this? Yeah, you, well, you know, I started to see myself slip backwards from my classmates. Like I, I was an avid baseball player. You know, I used to play third base and I was, I was real good and everything. All of a sudden I didn't have any interest to do in anything besides drinking and partying with my friends right yeah. away, you know? Mm-hmm. And it was like, it, I just saw my schoolwork was out the window. I started skipping school right away. But you know, back then, what I have to emphasize is at that time, you know, I was, I knew there was a problem, but we were also having a blast in the beginning. Right. You know, because that's how addiction grabbed me. And that's that's what I try to explain in my book and everything like that is it, it is an inviting tulip at first. The party in with your friends, the girls, all that stuff going up to UMass Amherst, all, all that stuff is it's it's at the time it sucks you in. And then before you know it, you're in a Venus flytrap and you can't get out. Talk to me about that, because what I think I hear you saying is that you basically you're 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 talking to another addict alcoholic. And I agree with you. Right. Yeah. That very first drink, something happened. All right. And yeah. what that something happened was if you really look back at it, it was this, Boston. Ah, oh, that sense of ease, right? It, it was, I, I remember thinking to myself out loud, we were in the woods, and I remember looking up and going, that is what I'm talking about. That's how I want to feel the rest of my life. Because all of that childhood drama went away instantaneously. There was right. a chemical change within me, and I knew it. So the tra- the childhood trauma literally it doesn't go away, but it's yeah. submersed. It's it's numb temporarily. Yeah. In order to stay numb, what do we do? We do more. Yeah. Okay. And as a result of that, okay, we do more. Then there's consequences that happen that we now we have self inflicted trauma. Yeah. And our solution to that, Boston, is to drink more. Drink so. More. When did the consequences start happening and when did we start really out unraveling? And uh, I'm going to let you just go. Well, you know, like right away I started getting into drugs too. It wasn't just, I didn't just drink. I mean, I was doing cocaine at 14 years old, experimenting with different harder drugs. That's where I got my first taste of Ritalin, Adderall, like your speed drugs. And I, I was just into doing uppers and drinking. And I just, that became my life, you know, and I started, uh, I just, I just started slipping back, you know, and partying. I dropped out of school in the 10th grade, you know, so I have a 10th grade education because of this addiction problem that I, I had as a baby, basically. I started, I mean, I started as a, an undeveloped kid and it, and it changed the course of my life forever, that first drink. And, uh, you know, I dropped out of school and I got a job at a gas station pumping gas. I was a petroleum transfer technician, you know. That's why I used to tell the girls and all that. <laughs> but, you know, it was a blast for a while, man. I, I can't lie. Like, a lot of people say that, it, you know, my writing and stuff glorifies that part of it. But if it wasn't fun, no one would do it. Right. So in the beginning, that's how it grabs you. And that's what I want to do is reach that kid who's just starting out on that journey. You know what I mean? Right. That's who needs to hear this stuff. Is It's like, what you're doing right now seems fun. But later on... You will be walking with the serpent if you're like me. Right. You know, and it turns into something very dark and very terrible in your life, you know? Well, let's, and, let's, uh, let's talk about that. What, when, when, did, when did this thing start getting dark? When did, and my story is, when did you start on the run? Not legally, legal's coming, but we're literally, <laughs> we're literally running from ourselves. 
Oh yeah, it was terrible. Like uh, you know, I started my descent. I would say into into the bad section. Okay, I started that in my like early twenties. Mm-hmm. You know, I turned 21 on a Friday night M2, and I was in rehab Monday morning. <laughs> Not many people can say that on their resume, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, and that's a, that's a true story. That was my first of nine treatment centers, okay? Wow. And, and uh, you know, it just snowballed. 23 years old, first DWI. Luckily, it was my only one. I should have had 100 more. Right. But, you know, so I started seeing consequences, you know. Mm-hmm. By the time I was 24, full blown cocaine and alcohol problem. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we moved to we moved to Corpus Christi. My grandpa passed away. We inherited a house. My me, and my dad moved down here together. Cocaine was really cheap at the time. Right. Like price, so I was like a kid in a candy store, literally. No pun intended. You know? uh-huh. And uh, and and things just got really bad. And then you know, around 25 years old, I got I, I was in I was just starting to go to the rooms the first time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, let me stop you for a second. Let me stop you for a second. When, when, if I understand you correctly, the rooms, you're talking about support group rooms. Yeah. 12 step programs and stuff. I I was exposed to it. My first rehab trip. Uh So I really started back then when I was about 21. Okay. But I just didn't get it. I wasn't, I wasn't ready. I just, I I didn't, I didn't suffer enough consequences yet. You know, you know me got to smash my head against the brick wall to learn. Right. Right. So, uh, you know, so I, I, I got exposed to that at about 25 years old. And I met a girl and I got married. I thought that was going to fix it all. Right. <laughs> you know, what am I like? A few years back, I moved to Vegas to get sober. That was a good move. When I was That's, a good, that's a typical alcoholic. Yeah. I said, I'm going to go out there. I was going to be a stand up comic. And uh, I ended up drinking instead. So yeah, that's, that's what happened. Right. You know, so I, I, at around 25, I get married and I have a family now, you know. And, uh, and, and that's, I, I actually got into the vacation rental business down in, in, on the Texas Gulf Coast. Okay. And I worked since I was 14. I was a full blown alcoholic doing the best I ever did, to be honest with you, in my career at that time. I mean, I, I was doing millions of dollars in sales. Right. And uh, that was a real descent into alcoholism. I mean, I was, I was in a town, I was in a little beach town where it's really hard to be the town drunk. And I was the town drunk. Yes. You know, and, it, and it was like I was making so much money for the town that they were just turning a blind eye to everything I was doing. I mean, I knocked the dog park fence down, the brand new dog park fence in my truck. I ran from the police helicopter on spring break at like that same time, and they gave me a traffic ticket. So I was, I was getting away with murder, you know. Right. And uh, but I was doing really well in my career. And then like you flash forward a few years, and that was my whole life. I made chasing money. My whole identity, the ego of being an alcoholic. It was like I would get up in the morning every day and I, I, I thought I was the biggest piece of crap in the world. Right. OK. And I would look in the mirror and literally tell myself, I'd say, you're the best. You're the king of vacation rentals. You know, and I then I started telling everybody else I was the king of vacation rentals. Right. Being that egotistical jerk, you know. But, you know, you flash forward a couple more years. And I got beat in a bad business deal. Drugs and alcohol did not take my career, to be honest with you. They used that in their story, but I had, I had signed. So I, I didn't have a contract. They fired me. They, they had everything they needed for me, all the clients and all that. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, I, am, I, am, I just spent 10 years building this career, and it's all over, and I don't know who I am. You know, and, and that's, it was who I was. And then I started drinking from the time I woke up. I pass out, start drinking again. And I was drunk literally 24 seven. The strain on the marriage is just terrible. I got three small children at this time. Right. You know? And uh, eventually that just fell apart. And me waking up in the morning, I believe it or not, during all that time, I was a very, I was a loving father. I was coaching teams. I was doing all that on top of working 80 hours a week and drinking full time at night. I mean, I was drinking an 18 pack of Bud and a bottle of Jaeger every single night, seven nights a week. And I did it for like seven years. And I was 360 pounds at the time. I was dying. And uh, and then that goes away. But the haunting noise of silence where I didn't wake up to hear my children in the next room killed me inside. And I decided that I was going to kill myself with drugs. I had just started experimenting with methamphetamines. Okay. And I got the taste for that. And... Then the fun starts all over again at that point because, and it sounds crazy, but 
I looked around. I, I moved to my dad's to Corpus again. It's like 30 minutes away. My whole old life is gone. So I, now I'm at my dad's house. I become a cab driver. Okay. Taxi driver. In Corpus Christi. Corpus Christi. God squad all day, every day. <laughs> so I, I'm a cab driver. I was, I was a businessman. I'm somebody, now mind you, I'm somebody who would not let you in my minivan if you had a joint of weed in your pocket because I was just, you know, that's too much. Full blown drunk, but the drugs I, I didn't do because I, I was scared of what would happen. Right. So now I'm starting to do a little bit of meth and I look around and I go, for the first time since I was a kid, I haven't had a drink in three weeks because now I'm doing meth, you know? Right. So, uh, you know, then I start getting into the cab thing. And the cab becomes a rolling felony, Michael. <laughs> That's, it is now a, a portable drug dealing business around this little sparkling city by the sea in Texas, you know? And, You're in a $20,000 cab with about $100,000 worth of smack in it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it was crazy, man. I mean, I'm getting into the seedy meth underworld of Corpus. There's prostitution, there is drug dealing, there is anything you can imagine. And I, I picked to drive at night because. Right. That's where I wanted to be. And, and I made a conscious decision at this time to kill myself with methamphetamines. I did not want to live without my family. And I didn't know, I didn't know how to live without my career, or my family. Right. I was basically, I just said, I was, it was, it was checkout time. And, but nobody told me, Michael, that meth doesn't really kill you per se before it drives you absolutely insane and all that, mm -hmm. you know, because I started really using, I went from zero to a thousand. I mean, I, I was an eight ball a day user. Mm. I had a $3,500 a month drug habit for a taxi driver. That's, you know, so I was supplementing my income by all this illegal activity and doing all this stuff. And I was basically, you know, I'm charging people off the meter and, and, and getting, you know, point for point all the dope and all that. Right. It, it was crazy. And, you plus, know? and plus, as we're doing this, we don't want to be confused when we start participating in this activity, making these what we call today ungodly illegal decisions. Yeah. We are feeling this. Okay. But we yeah. don't feel it long because we do more dope. It's this yeah. vicious cycle that the solution to make everything go away, we use more. Okay. Yeah. So obviously your taxi cab empire didn't last long. Is that correct? Well, that's correct. I mean, methamphetamines was a different type of deal. It, it, I could feel my soul dying. I could feel who I used to be completely changing into something completely different. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I was like, I was, I was starting to lose it, you know, a little bit after that. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm starting to, I'm really heavy into the life. You know, there's check cashers around. There's, there's all these like just weird rings of people and I'm, I'm deep into the life. It's my new identity now. I mean, this is a year after I started, you know, and it's like, uh, I just, that's who I was and that's the life I lived. So uh, everything's going okay for a while. So you are the perfect example of self will run riot. Oh yeah. It was, it was, it was like Motley Cruz the dirt on acid. Basically right. the only thing I could think of. I mean, it was, it was my dad's house became a, a stop on the net underground railroad in town. I mean, I was, it was just insane what was going on. Mm. Um, and, and, and I was staying up. On average, I put it on paper one time, on average, five days a week. Mm. And I'm driving people around in a taxi cab like that. Mm. No sleep. Team no sleep at all. So it was like, uh, you know, it was a very dangerous thing. So, you know, I got the cute girlfriend. I always got money in my pocket. So on the, out on the outward, I'm appearing to me in my head that I'm, everything's okay, you know. You know, I'm thin. I got the right. girlfriend, the car, and everything. But in reality, I'm sure I look like a complete tweaker. Right. You're, and, and, the, and the reality is completely spiritually bankrupt. Oh, all right. So not only bankrupt, Michael, but I found myself starting to walk with the serpent directly. I became a full blown sex and pornography addict through methamphetamines. OK, the lifestyle was insane. It was like Gene Simmons had overdosed on Viagra and turned loose on a sorority. It was crazy. Right. I mean, it was like it was just it was absolute madness. And it was very risky behavior, dangerous, flat out dangerous. Mm -hmm. So then my, uh, you know, I start cracking up a little bit at this point. Okay. And I start thinking these weird thoughts, but it's not so bad yet. Then my dad ends up, uh, you know, he starts getting sick 
And then I start spiraling really bad at the same exact time. Like my dad's like not feeling well and all that. And, and, and I'm starting to think these delusional thoughts of meth psychosis, the beginning stages of that. What do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by delusional thoughts? Well, okay. There's a chapter in my book called movie magic. Okay. I started to believe as fact and truth in my life that I was in a hidden camera movie that was being filmed about me like the Truman show. I thought Jim Carrey was the executive producer on this thing. Yes. So you were out there. I was spun way off planet earth. Gotcha. Now I'm keeping a lot of that in. So I don't tell people, so they don't think I'm crazy, but I think everybody's in on it. My dad gets sick. He goes to bed one night and he wakes up paralyzed. He's got spinal cancer. He, he had cancer the year before his scan came back fine. He goes to bed one night. He says, I don't feel good. He wakes up paralyzed. Hmm. It was a bad situation. The house was in bad shape because of what I was doing. And I become now his full-time caretaker for a paralyzed person. No wheelchair, no shower seat yet. It, it literally happened. We got no money because I'm a full-blown junkie. Mm -hmm. Now I'm shooting up meth nonstop, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm using dirty needles off the floor. Mm -hmm. I'm having unprotected sex with any woman that would come my way. Mm -hmm. Strange things start happening. I get further spun out. And then, uh, and then things start getting really crazy. Like I'm in Walmart, Michael. And I think that the cameras are hacked into mm -hmm. by this movie company. So I'm doing now my personality traits come out. I start doing like stand up comedy in the middle of Walmart. There's a crowd of people around stuff like that. I was doing it all over town. I got banned from every business in Southside Corpus. I was wreaking havoc on the whole town, walking around with a do rag on my head, dumpster diving now, yeah. finding a lot of cool stuff. I thought the movie put there. Yeah. But I had an explanation for everything. So Every day I got further out there and further out there. Okay. Wow. And, and then like my dad goes away to hospice and I think he faked cancer for the movie. So I'm like, no, my dad's in Hawaii playing golf with Tiger Woods. I go, everything's fine. Telling all my friends is they're like, they're looking at me like you're, you're, you're out of there, bro. And you, you truly know? believe this as fact. If you told me that Jim Carrey wasn't producing, I thought they were using satellite technology to film me outside. Wow. I thought they were using Harper in Alaska to change the weather. I mean, that's how I thought there was a there was a cat that used to come to my house and visit, you know. And I, at one point, I thought it was an animatronic cat from Japan that had cameras for eyes. That's how out there I was. And uh, and then I find out, uh, you know, the cops end up boarding up my house while I'm shooting meth in the bathroom. And I can hear the drills going. And then the power's off. Then the water's off because my dad's really in hospice care. And then I find out like I, I'm, I'm walking the streets for days and days and days, walking an average of 10 miles a day. My feet are bleeding. I'm in the Texas heat. I'm just out there. It, it was absolutely hell on earth. Mm. And I thought that the, this movie was going to end. I thought I thought I was going to get married at the end. I had all these delusional thoughts. I thought I was going to be a millionaire. Mm. I, I was known in Corpus for being the guy in the movie. Right. So. But at the same time, Michael, I've got to admit this. When I was in meth psychosis, I was having full on revelation. I, that's where God Squad came from. I started having these spiritual experiences with, with God. Let me flash back a little bit. I, I, I was in a cab accident. I have pictures of it that I'm putting in the book or whatever. And I think I showed you the pictures. I was in a taxi accident before this, before it really started getting bad, before I was even in psychosis. I hit a pole. I was up for four days. I hit a pole at 70 miles an hour, flat out. Mm. Seaboard sawed all five ribs in half. Mm. My foot was broken. I had drugs in the car that the cops found and just threw away. Wow. God was really looking out. But when I, right before impact, I felt something on my shirt like this, Michael. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I hit that thing. I watched that taxi collapse around me. The engine in the front seat, smoke, fire. The sign fell on top of the cab. You know, that's why I called it angels and signs. It's like God was trying to give me a sign. So he dropped it on my head because he knew I wasn't going to get it any other way. But that's where a major spiritual awakening started happening. Walk me through that. Yeah. And, and like I was having reoccurring thoughts after the accident. I thought I was going crazy, but I, I started to have like revelation about one time. About, it's perfect for right now. I was walking down the street one day and I had a revelation about why God created us different as different races and things about, about how he created us like the colors of the spectrum. 
-hmm. And then he's also testing us in our difference. And that's a test we're failing as a, as a race right now, as a humankind, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and But every race, this bone dripped out of my body at that time. Mm -hmm. I was having things happen that changed me to be the best version of myself today. It was a very strange experience. And it was like, I, for some reason, Jesus came to me. It mm -hmm. wasn't anyone else. No one. It wasn't Buddha. It wasn't Muhammad. I was a Catholic my whole life. I, I said I believed, but I didn't know. And at that time when the accident happened, I knew God was real at that time. And so that something was, happened. Something happened. changed at the moment where I realized, I said, there is something greater than me in this planet, in this, in this universe. And, and for me, he came in the form of Jesus. Okay. And, and, and that's what will be a but. What a lot of meth addicts have happened. I worked in the treatment industry when I got out and everything like that. We'll get into that in a little bit. But there's an experience where there's like an, a Jesus awakening in the meth world right now. And I believe like a lot of people are still out there in active addiction right now. I believe Jesus was in the bottom of that meth pipe. Hmm. I was having me. I was getting drunk in spirit. I was like I was giving messages to people. People were freaked out by me at that time. Mm -hmm. This is all in the book and I explain it in detail. But I was being touched by Jesus at that time. And. I didn't realize the direction he was about to push me. Wow. So then everything gets bad. I'm going around. Everybody stayed around for the crazy sex, the drugs, the parties. But when I started speaking about Jesus, my family and everybody I knew ran from me. Then I was crazy. Hmm. But to me, it was the beginning. Now, when, you were, when you were speaking about Jesus, were you still using? Oh, yeah. Hardcore. Okay. Hardcore. I was having these spiritual experiences and I thought I was in this movie, but that's where God Squad came from. I was thinking I was performing for all these cameras that didn't exist, but I invented this character for myself as like a champion of the people. God Squad all day, every day. And I was like glorifying his name. I was walking around downtown talking. I would leave my house at four in the morning and get on the bus. My car was repoed at this time, everything. And I'm walking out town with a t-shirt tied to my head like a do-rag. Because I, you, I would die with my Irish skin out there. And I'm talking to everyone who would listen about Jesus Christ. Hmm. And I'm high as could be. And I'm also crazy as could be. I was in full-on meth psychosis in right. the eyes of the mental health community. But that's where it began. And, uh, and then what happened was things got really bad. My dad's gone. I've got no friends anymore. I can't even cop or score because I'm just too crazy to function in, in, in any type of a world. Right. So uh, my brother, I call my brother in the uh, parking lot of a grocery store on the Wi-Fi because my phone obviously didn't work. You know? So I called him and he informs me that my dad had, had died three weeks before and I believed him. Something snapped. So I, I, uh, I went home. I was, in the, I was in my trap house in the country club estates in Corpus. My neighbors hated me. The house was boarded up in this beautiful neighborhood. I passed out on this filthy mattress. I wake up like four hours later, there's trash, dirty needles everywhere. I'm in a bathing suit covered in blood and self-inflicted knife wounds. And there was a knife near the, on the nightstand next to the bed. And I sat straight up and something came upon me. And I believe it was the Holy Spirit. And I grabbed that knife and out loud, I said, this ends now. Mm. And I walked across the street to the McDonald's and I walked to the front door and I opened the door and there was four employees in there. And I had, them, I had this big rusty butcher knife and I walked in. I said, this is not a robbery. Everybody get out of here. And they ran. And I decided that day I was going to take my life back. And they ran out. I threw the knife down. There's nobody in this McDonald's. I walk. I pour me a Coke. Grabbed a double, cheese, a, a double quarter pound or whatever was on the counter. And I sat and waited for the police. And I, and I said, I'm going to go to jail to get clean because that month leading up, my local drug treatment center turned me away twice for lack of a bed hmm. in the richest country on planet earth. I cried the second time I was there and I said, something bad is going to happen. They just didn't have a spot for me. Right. And, and something did happen. And, and uh, they ended up charging me for that. It was a $3 burger and a fountain drink. But because I had a knife, I got charged with aggravated armed robbery in Texas. That's a five to 99, three counts of aggravated assault, the deadly weapon, two to 20 each. I was facing over 120 years stacked or 100 years stacked. And, I, and then, uh, you know, I went to jail hmm. and, and then I was still crazy, mind you. I, it, I'm in jail now with no dope, with no dope, kicking dope, yeah. with no dope, uh, kicking. A, I was high on meth 
for 750 plus days straight without a day off, only sleeping when I took Xanax or passed out from exhaustion. I just, I was just running, man. Yeah. And the cab gave me the means to get, and I had a personal vehicle. I was driving 24 hours a day working for my dope. So I always had plenty of that. And I was just spun out and I was insane, literally. So they give me this lawyer. Let me stop you for a second. For everybody who's watching this, if you're confused about the gift of willingness, that is a perfect example that we all have willingness. We're willing to go to any link to get our dope, but in recovery, we switch it around and we're willing to go to any link to get sobriety. So you you get arrested at the McDonald's um, yeah. and you get and, and you and they throw it at you and you're and you locked up. Yeah. Was that the last day that you ever used? Yeah, that was June 3rd, 2018. That was the last day. Now, I, I was I was still full on crazy in jail, and I didn't even realize the severity of what was going on. I'm thinking I'm in a movie. You know, I'm, I'm in the jail performing, thinking everybody's an actor. I am completely spun out. Like, I'm singing Bump and Grind in the shower, thinking it's going to be a funny scene for the movie. Right. So, I'm like, I'm crazy. And, and uh, then I meet my lawyer. And he looks like the director, Martin Scorsese. So I'm thinking he's an actor. But this guy was the one of the top two pay attorneys in Corpus Christi. And by the grace of God, I got him as a public defender. Mm -hmm. And he realizes immediately that there's something severely, deeply wrong with my mental state. So he calls in uh, the doctors. He gets me evaluated right away. So now I start seeing psychiatrists. They put me on medication and whatnot. But Michael, honestly, it took me eight months until I saw a major miracle. I went to bed one night. I remember this. I was watching TV in the day room and everybody's around me. And I'm talking to the local weatherman thinking he could hear me, thinking that we're translating a conversation. And I went to bed and I woke up completely healed, snapped up. And, and I sat in the mirror above the sink and I go, oh man. I was like, wow. I'm like, all of that stuff I did, I was believing. It's not true. So I'm like, I, in one instant, you're looking in the mirror and you go, my dad's dead. My grandparents' house that we own only owed $40,000 on has been foreclosed on. I, I had the Corpus's first time, uh, nighttime yard sale in history with Christmas and, and the Halloween lights. And I sold all my grandparents' antique furniture thinking it was going to go to a storage unit that the movie was buying it. Oh. I, my, my grandma's Queen Anne chairs, I sold them for like $75 for the set. Right. Oh, whatever, just take it. You know. So uh, my brother won't talk to me. Alienated from my children. I don't know anybody. Everything's gone, and I realized it in one moment. And uh, and then, you know, a little bit before then, I started getting into the word, Michael. And and I was in solitary confinement for ninety days. When I started acting crazy in there, they they segregated me. Really? And I got into the word, and I started reading Ephesians six ten every single day. Wow. And then I started reading the book of Ephesians. Then I started reading a lot of the Bible. Then I read the New Testament three times when I was in jail. And I started, even though I was still crazy at the beginning of it, I started building a relationship with, with the real Jesus. Right. And I remember I was in solitary confinement one time. And I remember I was going to shake my fist at the Lord. And I sat back down on that bunk and I was angry, hurt, and scared. And I knew I was facing 99 years and everything. And I was like, why did everybody leave me? And I was about to shake my fist at the Lord until I realized he was all I had left. Mm. And, and, and what he did was, and looking back, I realized that Jesus, that God tore me to bare foundations so that he could build me into the man that he always intended me to be. I can relate to that. Yes. And, and it was like every, my foundation was burnt down. It was a clean slate. And then now I'm thinking clear. And I made a decision. I never want to go back to the game. My friends, my best friends saw me on the news. I mean, it's on YouTube. If you, if you YouTube my name, mm -hmm. they robbed my house when they saw me on the news. My best friends, the, the, the jailers came and said, hey, so-and-so and so-and-so are at your crib. And they're taking out everything that's left. And there wasn't much. And then I realized, I go, I have to rebuild my whole life. So, uh. Then I call my lawyer. It's the day before trial. Okay. Now we're, 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 we're looking at almost 10 months in nine months in. I call him. And I said, Hey, uh, I'm like, what are we looking at here? Now I'm totally sane. And he goes, I'm sorry, Mr. Durkin. We're, we're looking at 15 years. TDC is what they're offering mm. for that $3 burger. You know, 
And I, I was 30 feet from the closest person. My first felony arrest of all time. And uh, I go to trial the next day. We have a bench trial set. Now, granted, we saw the doctors and everything. And I had a report where I was deemed incompetent for a while and, and all that. He tells me that I'm going. So I'm walking through a tunnel, Michael, going from Nueces County Jail to the Nueces County Courthouse. It's, there's light, there's like dim lights and leaky pipes and everything. Now, my dad was in a wheelchair, okay, and I, when I was his caretaker. And I see something in the distance. There was 12 men shackled together. That's important. And we walked through, and we're shackled, and we're, we're walking through the chains. It's God Squad all day every day. Mm-hmm. And we're walking, and I see something in the distance. And I walk by this thing. It is the same make. The same model, same color wheelchair that my father had in the middle of a tunnel in the middle of nowhere on the way to court. And something inside of me said, everything's going to be okay. And I, when I emerged into the courtroom, my lawyer came right up to me and he says, we beat the case. Wow. Miracle. NGRI yeah. finding where I was found not guilty by reason of insanity. And drugs disqualify you in the state of Texas for that finding. So if you have drugs in your story, they'll comb your Facebook, everything. I was in open court three times. To the doctors, the DA, and the judge mentioning that I was under the influence of methamphetamines for two years prior. And it was like they were blinded by it. So they release you from jail. Okay. Right. You don't have to go to prison. They don't send you down the road. Obviously, you probably were on probation, right? No. What happens in an NGRI trial, and nobody knows this, and neither did my lawyer. He goes, you're going to go to this mental hospital for uh, 30 days, and uh, then you're going to come home. And I get up there. I went to Vernon Maximum Security. I mean, you're talking like Andrea Yates was there. Yeah. You're talking like big profile, high profile, the worst of the worst, serial killers, child murderers, rapists, all the worst of the worst in Texas go to this facility. And we pulled up there and I'm thinking 30 days. It looks like a prison, but it's it's the craziest environment you've ever seen. Hmm. I'm there for a month and a half and I get stepped down to a lower facility. I'm like, I'm out of here in two weeks. They told me two weeks more and you're going home. And I get there and the doctor tells me, Oh, Mr. Durkin, um, in the state of Texas, on average, for a felony one crime like yours, we're looking at three and a half to five years uh, psyche now because they can't release you until they know that you're not crazy. You know, Mm. I'm on nine different medications. Flash forward, I'll just go through it really quick. I convinced the doctor that there was nothing wrong with me, and I told him I was in methamphetamine psychosis. And the power of the Lord was in me, and I convinced that man that I don't need this medication, and he gave me a shot. And he said, we're going to take you off everything. I was having like erectile dysfunction. I was, I mean, I was, those pills are really bad for you. Right. State hospital is a really bad place to be. Right. I'm in San Antonio now. So he takes me off and I start going and, and I start to crack because you're around the craziest environment in speech, tons of violence, sexual assault, neglect. It is the worst environment you could possibly think of. And what kind of therapy is being provided to you by the state of Texas? Are you are you able to do have support groups? Are you working with people who are who are getting deep with you and 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 trying to get to find the solution of listen, if you're a recovering alcoholic or drug addict, are you watching this and you're still out there in the noise? The most frustrating thing is, and I I bet you can relate to this, Boston, is that when someone would ask me, why do you drink? Why do you do drugs? I didn't know why. I did not know why I was doing the things I was doing. And yeah. and today, today, let me, let me fast forward a second. Can you answer that question? Did you know why you drank and did drugs? When, when I started to become normal in jail and I was and I was reading my Bible every day, I did a full examination on the root causes of my problems. Mm-hmm. Number one, I think I was spiritually afflicted. That was that was my deal is I think I, I since I was a kid, I felt a deep sadness. I think that I had a generational curse with me. Uh, the other thing was I was I had abuse in my childhood story. I think that I stayed drunk because of that for 23 years. So you had trauma. It was trauma and it was resentment and yes. hurt and rage. And, yeah. and, and I could not let go. Mm-hmm. And it was my mom and me. And we had a bad relationship. And I'll tell you this. That woman came to me in my incarceration when I had no one. And we repaired that relationship through the power of Jesus Christ. And we became closer than I've ever been to my mom. Mm. I haven't seen her in 20 years. She's putting money on my books. We repaired that. God brought us together when nobody else could. And and when I wouldn't even allow it myself, I repaired that relationship. Then I started looking at my sexual deviancy and my meth addiction. I started looking at all the stuff that kept me out there. In which, let me help the, the, the listener with this. In a 12-step recovery, that is a thorough fourth and fifth step. Right. 
which when we do step three correctly, which I can translate in different languages, we made a decision to turn our will and life over the care of God as we understand him or we're born again. We, yeah. we, we surrender to God. Step four and five, a lot of healing happens. And it sounds like you got a lot of healing when you were doing your inventory and looking at yourself. Yes. And then when I was in the hospital, the coolest thing about my story, in my opinion, that happened that what saved my life was that I, I had no one to talk to. There was no elder alcoholics and drug addicts. You're talking like severe schizophrenia patients, severe bipolar one. I was the only people that I could talk to were the techs and you couldn't talk to the techs, you know? Yeah. So I, I figured out in the client's rights handbook because I'm who I am. And I, I just said, I'm going to try to make this as painless as possible. I found out I can have a cell phone in there as long as I took the cameras out. So I get this cell phone and I start going to like, recovery pages, Christian sites. And I start writing short stories from my experience. Hmm. And I start posting them on these sites because I have nowhere to save them. So I, and I didn't know about the cloud or anything. I'm not really tech savvy. So right. I'm posting to have a record of, of these stories. Mm -hmm. And people started going crazy. And I realized I found a gift to be a really good writer at 37 years old. And I have a 10th grade education. I could barely spell, but I was writing beautifully. It was the spirit writing that stuff. Yeah. I recognized it, man. And it's like it was pouring out and I was getting this huge response that built my confidence. And that was my therapy. And that was the beginning of Fire and Ice. All those stories, I rewrote them when I got out. But all those stories got such a big response. I go, you know what? I'm going to write a book about this experience and I am going to change people's lives. I'm gonna I'm gonna be naked in in, in my uh in my truth so others can be clothed in recovery. Mm. So all my shame went away. I said I got this YouTube video out there. I'm forever branded for what happened to me. So I'm gonna go all the way with it and try to help some people through that experience. And so how are you doing that today? What's Boston doing today? I am uh you know I stay with the Lord. I have that same Bible that I had in jail. I, I did 18 months total. I became such a problem for the hospital. They let me go because I was, I was like fighting for people's rights. My roommate escaped. I got the media. It's a great story. It's all in the book. I, you know, but I, I stay with the Lord today. I really had a miracle happen to me when I first started getting in the state hospital system. I realized I'm no longer having the dreams. Mm. I'm no longer having the obsession. I, I mean, since I was a young kid, I, when I wasn't drinking, I used to think about getting wasted all day. Mm -hmm. Everything else was just a distraction from that. Right. All of a sudden I realized I go, this isn't, it's not affecting me anymore. I had a true miracle from God. So I get out, I'm released on this miracle release. You know, I won't go into the whole thing. It'll take forever, but I, I get out and I go to an Oxford house. And an, I, Oxford I, house is, an Oxford house is what? It's a recovery based home and it's really affordable. And it's, it's perfect for somebody in early recovery that doesn't have a lot of money. It's structured environment. You, you're required for your first 30 days to go to five meetings a week. And, and it's just a perfect place to put somebody in a safe, structured environment with their peers. And you can meet a lot of good people and it, it encourages the 12 step programs and it branches you out. Right. And, I, and I had no choice but to live there because it was like at the time it was all I had. My, I had a family member rob me of $11,000 mm -hmm. the, 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 the week before I got out. And I came out homeless. They dropped me downtown with a bag full of dirty clothes. And I went and I took a third of the money I had and I bought a phone with a camera in it. And I started shooting my first videos on Facebook Live. Hmm. And I did that so that I could document the journey that no matter how bad things get, even when we're homeless, drug addicts never have to use again. And I wanted wow. to prove that to the world. Wow. And I did that and I shot videos all day, every day, God Squad. And you know, I was all over town. And I, you know, there's a part of my book. I was, I went the first night out, I went to a motel in the worst part of town for my addiction. And I said, the streets felt different because I was not the same. Something within me transformed. I truly knew the Lord was real. And today what I do to stay clean and sober is I keep my faith in God. And, Let me and ask you something. Let me ask you something, Boston. Yeah. The more that, and, and I love your story. And this is what I, this is what I wanted tonight. And for everybody watching tonight and listening, and and we know on M two the Rock, I I I really really push love and tolerance is our code. Yeah, love and tolerance is our code. And, and, and Christ says this. He says, listen, if you can only just if you can hold on to two things in the Bible, 
it's this serve me and love everyone serve me and love right. everyone golly she is killing it upstairs you know, Mike, one thing i will say is this is like a lot of people have questioned the miracles that happened to me and people have called me out and said that's impossible and 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 with jesus christ anything's possible what happened to me is not a common thing i mean i had a, i had a sponsor when i got out and he was an lcdc and i told him all my experiences we worked the first few steps and I, I, we had extensive conversations about my spiritual experiences. There is way more I left out because of time. But so I, let, let, let me ask you, I'm, I'm getting to something. I don't mean to cut you off, boss. Yeah, hey. I really want to get something out of this because there is something about you that intrigues me. There is okay. something, there's something there that I like. I'm going to go on. I like it. There's something I like. Okay. Yeah. And I, I look at upside with everybody right because i was that guy i was that guy that gave everything away i was that guy that had that bright light moment in prison yeah. i was that guy that was miraculously released and wasn't supposed to be released i get yeah. it i yeah. get it let me ask you what's your spiritual gift what is your gift that god has given you and you know what i don't know is a fair answer but what do you think your gift is? What is your purpose on, on this planet? Hands down, he gave me a gift to write and to tell stories. I mean, I've been out. I wrote a 300-page book about my bio, about my life. I've written a book of poetry, and I'm on my third book, and I've been out since December 16th. And and, 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 and the book has gotten wide response. They say People say it's written beautifully. I've got it. It's The last chapter is being edited right now, and I believe it's a hit book, 100%. And, and, and I fully believe that it could be made into a motion picture. Maybe God, but just maybe when I was in that movie, maybe he was showing me the way the whole time. Ah. And, and anything's possible with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what I that's what I always told people. And people knock me for it and they say it's impossible. But my story is not common. But Jesus can tr create true miracles in people's lives 100 percent all day, every day. Right. I agree with that. I agree with that 100 percent. No recovery is wrong, Michael. What's that? <laughs> No road to recovery is wrong. That's true. As long as we're doing recovery. So what what is a um what is your recovery program look like for the newcomer out there that's watching this for the first time and, and they hear you and they're going, dude, this guy's telling my story. How is Boston staying sober on a daily basis? How is he not putting needles in his arms? Well, you know, I uh, like I said, like everything was removed as far as the urges and all that. But what I do is I stay with God all day. I give him glory for everything. All my writing and all that, that's not me. That's that's the Father pouring the Holy Spirit upon me. So I stay busy. I found my passion and my purpose. I pour myself into that. I have a great group of people on my Facebook. Like during COVID, I'll jump on lives just to get social interaction, talk to other people, stay in that mindset of being healthy. And, uh, and you know, because writing this book was a dark process. Right. To really take that thorough of a look at yourself and, and be bringing the, the reader into the room with the smells. I mean, people have read my stuff and, uh, and, and, and it's, it's, it's really graphic and point. There's going to be a big trigger warning on that bad boy. But I, I made the experience real for the reader so they could know what I went through if they've never been an addict. And it'll bring you back to where you used to be if you have been. I tell you this. Let me, let me um, for the newcomer out there that's hurting right now and yeah. they want to call Boston right now. Yeah. They reach out to you and they want to stop using. Yeah. What do you, what do you do? What's your, what's your, how do you help that person? I tell them to walk in the omni path of truth and love. You know, I don't push Jesus on anybody. I'm not your typical Christian. I believe that we should fish for men by living, by letting our light shine and being loving, tolerant of other people. And I think that we should uh, accept everybody for what they believe in. But I would tell that person to just know that there is something much greater than ourselves out there. No matter what you believe, look within, let go of all the negativity in your life that you're hanging on, all the things that are causing you to have resentments and rage that create those problems. Get a good group of people together that you can reach out to and talk to and, uh, and, and surround yourself with friends and family. But put God first, because for me, I failed in the programs. For, two, for 15 years, nothing worked, nine rehabs, hopeless alcoholic. I mean, they, they, my, they drew my blood at the, uh, at the hospital. They said, if you didn't start smoking methamphetamine and stop drinking when you did, you would have been in a box between 30 and 90 days. 
God, he stepped in and gave me that other addiction to save me from the one I was dying from. And I had no clue I was walking around with a failed liver, blown up spleen. He created a lot of miracles in my life that I left out of this. But, but it was like I was on a path. Recognize to that person, recognize that if you've lived through everything you've lived through in addiction, look back at all the near death brushes. I mean, I had a 357 Magnum put in my face. I had three major car accidents. I look back on all that now and I say, God spared me and kept me alive and healthy because he's got a major purpose for me on this planet. And that keeps me going. It pushes me forward and it motivates me to do, be the best version of myself that I could be today. And, and I think once you find that, that's, that's what changes everything. That's beautiful. That, I, I like that. I like that a lot. I like that. Let me, let, let's, let's, let me throw some stuff at you. We cease, we cease fighting everyone, everything, including alcohol and drugs, right? Yep. I love that. That's really helped me. And we talked earlier about um, resentments. And if you just joined us, my name is Michael Moulton. I'm host of M to the Rock. Uh, we've got Boston Durkin uh, on the show tonight. And, <laughs> and uh, Boston is um, just shared his story. He's, he's got quite the story. Um, I've heard a bunch of great stories, but the same common denominator with everybody's story is the same. Okay. I drank alcohol. I did drugs. The pain was temporarily removed. So I did more drugs and more alcohol and the pain went away. I swore and I was promising to God that I would never do it again. I was drunk and high that night. I'm powerless over this deal. I get it. Okay. Yeah. And I truly believe that um, in order for God to set me free, I had to set everyone around me free. Right. Yeah. And I truly believe that the number one offender that kills the human race, not alcoholics and drug addicts, is resentment. I truly believe that's what Satan does. It's the devil. Just, just, I need, if I can get you resentful towards somebody, something, or someplace, I got you. How does Boston process resentments today in sobriety and walking with the Lord? You know, I mean, I'm. <laughs> You know, you know me, Dr. Truth, you know, I speak up for what's right and I don't, I don't care. It gets me into some controversy and things like that. It's the one the bad guys love to hate, Michael. It's the Louis Vuitton Mastodon. But you know what? It's like anything that comes my way, I just try to live in a world of facts and truth and just try to, I just try to let go of everything. I mean, I, I, I go ahead and I fight my battles, but I don't try to hang on to things and take things so personal today. You know, I've got a bigger purpose than that. You've got to let things go and uh, and just realize it's like I had, Michael, I had so many spiritual experiences I had to leave out of this, and they're all in the book. I mean, I've seen vulgar displays of power when it comes to evil. I've had multiple unexplainable miracles, and and I've felt the loving hands of Jesus save my life. And, and, and for me, it's a weird place to be. But after you experience something like that, this book and this story is so extreme. If you, if you really went through it all, then you would understand it's I was touched by the loving hands of, of God. Right. And there's no other way to explain why I don't have HIV, why I, my liver is not why, why I don't have cirrhosis, why I, I didn't die in all those car accidents, why I wasn't killed, why I wasn't put in prison the rest of my life with all that drug activity. I look back on it and every day is a gift for me. Hmm. And, and I realized that he spared me with loving hands because. He's ferrying me to the next place and I know he's got a purpose and it changed my life. Boston Durkin, um, we want to have you back on. We, there, there's something about you that is good. And I mean, everybody, we've had so many guests on the show. We've got a lot of guests in the audience that are watching and I appreciate everyone that has turned it, you know, tuned in tonight. Um, I appreciate I tell you. you People who are in solution, recovery comes in all forms and fashions. And, yeah. and I wanted to, um, I want everybody to know that I reached out to you. Okay. Yes, you, you caught my attention and there's something, there's just something about you as well as everybody that I have, that I have um, engaged with that I love everybody. That's why yeah. I'm always in the show. I got three words, eight letters, one meaning. And that is, I love you. Yes, sir. Hate Hate is a luxury I don't have anymore. Okay. Right. Anger is a luxury I don't have anymore. Resentment is a luxury I don't have anymore because, because God has got a purpose for us. And I wanted to, resentment blocks me from God. It right. blocks me from God and I can't see him. I can't feel him. 
And in order for the resentment to go away, I've got to look at what role I play in it. That's why I have a resentment. Right. And once I accept that role that I play in it, then I'm free. And then I can go tell the world, hey, this is how I got through my resentment. You know, right. there's so many bigger problems in the world that we could be solving as a community, like the, uh, the, the treatments that are about like how I got turned away twice in the richest country in the world, we should be able to get treatment under the affordable care act. Okay. Just like if you walked into a, a hospital and you had cancer because addiction for me was a stage four cancer and I, I went into treatment and I couldn't get it. And I, I was forced to commit a crime and I faced almost the rest of my life in prison for that $3 burger. So I think that we need to have discussions, drop the little things, Stop dividing each other with race and start fixing the world's problems and looking to God for direction every day. God squad all day, every day. I tell you what, you if you got solutions and topics to talk about it, you are here. You are invited here for any time you want to. And everybody out there, everybody out there, this is a show for solutions. And we talk about solutions and how we can... Um, we can go out there and help everyone. Hey. Foster, I'm going to put you backstage real quick. Don't go anywhere. I've got some closing thoughts and you have a closing thought real quick. Yeah, Miss Rachel, I used to be an alcoholic. <laughs> I, I figured I had to squeeze it in. My, Michael, thank you so much for having me. God squad all day, every day. BostonDurkin.com. You can buy these and, and you can look at Fire and Ice and the new book's going to start popping real soon. It's going to be done and we're getting it up to publishers all over the United States. So thank you for having me on, bro. Thank you so much, Boston. We appreciate right. you. And um, well, I'll be right back with you. Thank you. Hey, that what a great show tonight. And I, I want to, um, I saw a lot of um, M2 family on there. I appreciate every one of y'all uh, for tuning in tonight. Um, we love everybody. I do. I do. And I, I wanted to um, take the opportunity to have, everybody has the right to tell their story. Everybody has the right to tell their story. And we are so um, excited that um, Boston uh, was on the show tonight and sharing his experience, uh, strength and hope. So we are very glad we got a great show. We got um, guests coming up this week. Um, we got uh, Keenan Williams uh, will be in studio or live on this new format. The new norm uh, will be live um, on M2 The Rock. And then we have Hillary Roberts coming up. And yes, you can hear uh, Rachel Stacey's up in the studio yelling the way she is right now. Um, on a Zoom call with The Voice uh, in Beverly Hills. So that's kind of neat. So she's on the be uh, working to be on The Voice. So we're really excited about that. So I got three words. I got eight letters and it's got one meaning. And that is, I love you. Make it a great night. Good night.